our initial assessment for Mr. Hill. I don't know why that keeps going. So as you can see, um, you have this information in the PowerPoint and in the couple of handouts I gave you, which are the same one, just in a Word document, the other one says a PDF. So he is 71 years old. His past medical history, uh, BPH, he's got PVD, he's got myodysplastic syndrome two months ago after a bone marrow biopsy, he was diagnosed with that. Six weeks ago, he was admitted because he had a syncopal episode. He was diagnosed at that time with um, atrial fib and acute anemia. Um, his hemoglobin on admission six weeks ago was 6.9. And at that time, he did receive one unit of average blood cells six weeks ago. So today, he's coming in. To the hospital with increased weakness, fatigue, sinus congestion, fever, chills over the past week. He's been around his grandchildren um, with colds uh, two weeks ago. He woke up at 6 a.m. today feeling short of breath. He's got a cough. He's got clear sputum. He's having difficulty walking to bed after getting up to the bathroom. His wife is a retired nurse and Noticed that he was also pale. Um, took his vital signs. Look at that blood pressure. Blood pressure was 96 over 62. His heart rate was 140, irregular. Um, his respirations are 24. And he has lost 15 pounds over the past two or three months. His personal um, social history lives with his wife in a rural area. He's got adult children, but they live out of state. He's always been active and healthy. Um, he's been dealing with changes in his health, and he has not been able to participate in activities that he likes. In the past, he's been employed as a minister. So um, that is significant to know because of his um, Christian faith. He's got a strong Christian faith, so that's very important to know. He denies smoking, alcohol use, or illicit drug use. So the first question to ask you is, is what data from the histories are relevant and must be interpreted as clinically significant by the nurse? So when we look, we'll see he has a uh, new diagnosis of myodysplastic syndrome. He's got a diagnosis of atrial fib. He has acute leukemia, which is also um, 6.9 with his hemoglobin, and he did receive papyrus blood cells at that time. Um, Also significant is um, fatigue, weakness, sinus congestion, fevers, chills in the past week. That's important. He's been around grandchildren who've had a couple of colds this past week. And um, he woke up this morning, shorter breath, cough, clear speed him though, but that's important. He's having difficulty walk, walking because probably because of his weakness. Mm -hmm. And um, his vital signs at home, look at his vital signs. So all that's important. All of those things in his history, that of his present problem is important. But then you went over and say, well, why is it important? So that's what the clinical significance is about. So the myodysplastic syndrome um, is uh, a type of a bone cancer that the patient has, so that's important to know. And um, if it's not treated, it can contribute to the client's symptoms that he's having. He's had recent medical history of his atrial fib. We already know that. And um, low hemoglobin, so that's why it's important to know. Um, 
um, you see the uh, increasing weakness, fatigue, sinus congestion, fever, and chills over the past week. So what may have been a viral infection can progress to a significant secondary infection for this client. Um, so you're going to listen to those lung sounds because you want to listen for any uh, pneumonia sounds, early fusions, that type of thing. So that's what you're going to be looking for. And his uh, grandchildren, because they can be a, a source of infection as well, right? We all know that children can be a source of infection. Um, how he woke up this morning with a shortness of breath and cough indicates a problem with his respiratory or cardiac system. We don't know yet, but it's very significant. We need to look into that. Difficulty walking, so he's got some weakness. That should be a red flag because that indicates that he's got some type of something underlying going on. Being pale could be uh, the result of a, a lot of things. It could be um, severe anemia and hypotension, being that these were his vital signs at home. So that makes it clinically significant as well. He also has weight loss. So weight loss is another red flag as well. So we need to look into that. So that's very significant. Looking at his social history, you see that he's always been active. But clinically, with the new onset of um, the disease processes that he's got going on, he's not been able to do that, be active. Um, since he's been dealing with changes in his health, he's not been able to participate. So that's going to be an emotional and a mental toll on him because he's not able to do things that he used to do. And um, socially, also, he's a, a minister. So um, religion is can, may come into play. As part of this past medical history, you can look at his home medications. So these are his home medications. He takes um, Plavix, Chemicel, and um, Atenolol. That's what he takes right now. So <clears throat> which of these medications go with what disease process? So whenever you look at the, whenever you're at the hospital or you're doing one of these type of clinical um, case studies, you need to make sure that you are familiar with the patient's um, history as well as their current diagnosis. So you want to make sure that you look at their past medical history and those home meds, and you have to make a connection between those medications. So with these medications, you understand what goes with where. Right. But you're going to have to look up um, BPH and you're going to have to look up PBD and the myodysplastic syndrome as well as the atrial fib to see the connection with the medications. So make sure that whenever you are looking that up, that you see connections and how they, they go. So he's transferred um, to a room. You introduce yourself. And this is where your patient care begins. So you have his current vital signs. His heart rate's uh, 148, and it's irregular. Respirators are 24, blood pressure 104 to 60. He is adding 88% on room air. Which isn't good, is it? So you want to look at the current vital signs. Make sure you understand those. So then your next question is what vital sign data is relevant and must be interpreted as clinically significant by the nurse? Well, you're going to take each one of these vital signs 
and you're going to uh, interpret them and why they're important. Now, if it's within normal range, then there's nothing to interpret. Does that make sense? You're looking at the abnormal stuff. That's what you're going to interpret. So here's temps 99.6. So this is a slight temperature. Infection is a clinical red flag because it has the MDS, right? And that sense why uh, cells may be altered with that. So the temperature is significant, and that's why. His heart rate's 144 irregular. So an uh, increased heart rate is irregular, and he's tachycardic, right? Because he's greater than 100, so he's in that tachy category which likely causes an arrhythmia. Now he has a history of atrial fib, so he could be back in that atrial fib again. We look at his respiratory rate. His respiration is 24, so that's slightly elevated. So he's tachypnic, that's a red flag, so you need to make sure that you're monitoring his respiratory rate um, because you don't want it to maintain or him to sustain that elevated respiratory rate because he can um, go into respiratory failure as a result of that. His blood pressure is low. 104 over 60, that is significantly low. And that could be secondary to early sepsis, right? Because he's got a temp, so he's got um, probable infectious. Um, or it could be related to the rapid heart rate. So his heart rate is increasing because the blood pressure is low. So it's trying to compensate for the low blood pressure. That's why his heart's beating faster. That's compensation. So that could be why. So you have two reasons why his blood pressure could be low. Hypertensive because of infection or hypertension related rapid heart rate. Then you see his Stats are 88. So he's clearly hypoxic. Um, even though he's breathing kind of fast, he's still needing enough oxygen uh, to maintain adequate oxygenation. So this is a red flag as well. It should be recognized by the nurse. So make sure does everybody understand why these are significant. So then you're going to start your assessment. So now you're going to start your assessment findings on this client. So your general survey, how he appears. He appears ill. He's weak, barely able to stand. He's not in any acute distress at this moment, but his appetite is decreased uh, recently. And you learn that from the medical history. He's alert and oriented place, time, situation, muscle strength, he's got um, bilateral muscle strength, um, <clears throat> pupils equal reactive delight, and John are pale, I remember that his wife said he looked pale, his tongue and oral meats are pale and dry. So let's look at his respiratory, so his rest sounds are clear, but he's um, very diminished bilaterally with fine calls in both places. So down deep, you're listening to those posterior lung sounds so you can get those bases. Those posterior lung sounds are where you're going to hear that. So he's got thigh and crackles there. He's got a persistent cough, a labored respiratory effort on the air, on clear sputum. Cardiac, he's pale, warm, dry. He's got one plus edema. Heart sounds are irregular. He's tachycardic. Pulses are faint, so you're going to feel for that. Pulses are, paint, are faint with radial and pedal and post um, tibial. Um, at no JVD. And when he's sitting up at a 35 to 45 degree angle, you don't see any J JVD. His abdomen is soft, round, non tender. He's got active bowel sounds. You see that he's voiding uh, without any. Any difficulty, although his urine is um, clear, although it's a dark amber color, which could be um, a sign of dehydration. His skin, he's warm, dry, and intact, no clubbing of the nails, capillary refill less than three seconds, nail beds. Skin is intact, uh, 10 
my skin turger. It does have some mild tinting presence, so you may be a little um, bit on the dry side, right? So that's your current assessment that you get. So then the next question says, what assessment data is relevant? It must be interpreted as clinically significant by the nurse. So here's the assessment that you got. So now you have to address what of that data is important. Because not everything is, right? If it's within range, it's not important. You're going to look at the abnormal stuff. So we look at the general survey. Um, feel weak, barely able to stand. That's significant because that's a red flag. That could be related to the MDS, fluid and electrolyte abnormalities or sepsis, because remember he does have a low temp. Out of his um, ears, nose, and throat, he's got some anemia that we know of. Remember, he was 6.9, so he's been anemic in the past, secondary to the MDS, so that needs to be addressed as well. His respiratory, so he's diminished. He has no history of CPD. However, he's got some crackles in this basis, so that's going to be uh, clinically significant because he's got the crackles. Depending on how long he's been in the atrial fib. So now we're going to look and see why that atrial fib um, can cause heart failure. If that atrial fib is sustained for a long period of time. Remember that atria equivering right so you've got that backflow of accumulation of blood right because it's not pumping strong enough to help pump that into the to the ventricle so we can push it out right so that atrial is not contracting so you can have that accumulation of fluid and that can make the patient go into heart failure so that's how atrial fib over a long period of time can cause that. So here we're starting to make that connection of stuff we just went over and stuff we're going to go over tomorrow. So now this is where the heart failure comes into play. So he's slightly labored respiratory effort. He does have a persistent cough, but the sputum's clear. So that's significant to know. Um, so we need to make sure that we are looking to see if he's got any pneumonia that's developing some infectious process because of that low temp, right? But you would expect with an infection that sputum to be yellow or green. So um, it's not at this point. However, it's something that we still need to rule out or to follow up with this patient to see if that's what's going on. Cardiac wise, he's pale, warm. He's got one plus edema. So we do have a little bit of, of uh, edema, some swelling going on, right? Heart sounds irregular, right, because he's in that atrial fib. He's tachycardic, so he's over 100. And those pulses are faint whenever you're, you're trying to feel that. So the is pale in color with anemia. Depending on how long he's been in that atrial fib, we're looking at that possible heart failure because that's where that edema is coming into play. So now with that heart failure, potential you may have some edema. That irregular rapid pulse is consistent with your atrial fib. So we're going to keep looking into that. Um, he's voiding without any problem remember even though it's dark amber. So dark amber urine is consistent with dehydration or liver process but with this patient it's probably going to be um, some dehydration. And then his skin is intact, so, um, but he's got some mild tinting. And it could be related to the aging process or it could be dehydration. So that's what's clinical significant because you have to, you're trying to fit all the puzzle pieces together to see what's going on with them. So now you can look at that strip. So what is this? What rhythm is this? You guys know. What rhythm is that? Twenty-eight. 
try again. <clears throat> First of all, is there a P wave present? Yes or no? Yeah, that's right. Is there a P wave present? Yes or no? We're looking here. Is there a P wave? No, there is no P wave. Now, is that R to R regular? Is about the same number of boxes in between each one of those R to R? No. So, no P wave, irregular R to R. What's your rhythm? Your rhythm is going to be atrial fib. It's not flutter because atrial flutter is more regular. And it, you have a distinct sawtooth pattern. Remember, here you do not have a distinct sawtooth pattern. It's very coarse along this baseline. The R to R's are irregular. So you're going to have an atrial fib. And that's what this is. So this is your atrial fib. And this client, we would say he's an atrial fib with a rapid ventricular response because he is greater um, than 150. So he's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve, He's got a heart rate around 170. Uh, so he's in what we call a rapid ventricular response with his heart rate. So why is this important to know what the patient's heart rate is? Well, he has a past history of atrial fib. And now he's back in the hospital with atrial fib again. So we have all know that with this return of this atrial fib, and was he taking an anticoagulant at home? Has he taken anything to prevent clotting at home? Yes or no? Go back up and look at those drugs real quick. <clears throat> and tell me if any of those were um, were significant as far as being an anticoagulant or anti um, any any takers on that yes it was on plavix right right Which is important, which you kind of need to know that, right? Because we don't want him to develop, to, to develop a stroke. He was on some Plavix at home. Yep. So knowing that he's in a rapid atrial fib is very important. You got to know that. Yeah. You got to really kind of know that. Now, next in your um, student packet here. It says, interpreting relevant clinical data, identify potential problems. What additional data is needed to identify priority problems and nursing priorities? So now we're going to look and see what are some potential problems with the information that we know. So infection, right, because of the low grade temperature. He's got fine crackles in the bases. So we're looking at maybe some pneumonia or some sepsis. So both of all of that's very significant. Those are likely problems with the client. Atrial fib with um, RVR, that's very um, that's a problem as well, likely problem. So additional data you're going to need. You're going to have to have some blood work for the um, infection. So you need a CBC. Uh, chest x-ray because we want to look to see if they have pneumonia right or 
we're going to look and see if they have what else could they have going on um, that you might see on that chest x-ray going on home with their heart or their lungs. Yes, fluid buildup. Yes. As you could see, like an enlarged ventricle, right? You could see some heart failure. Um, in addition to if there's any uh, fluid or pneumonia in that chest x ray. So that's what other thing we're looking at. We are also going to draw a lactic. A lactic acid is a sepsis indicator. So that's what you would see whenever you do a lactic acid. You're going to hear that term in the hospital quite a bit. Um, that is a big deal, um, patients who have sepsis. Also going to do a sputum. So we can get him to call that morning uh, sputum up, right? That's the first one we need. We can do a blood culture and urine culture as well. Then, of course, we want that 12-lead EKG, um, not just a monitor uh, EKG. We want a 12-lead EKG as well. So you're going to need all this additional information. So what is the patient experiencing or feeling right now in this situation? What can you do to engage yourself with a client's experience and show that he or she matters to you as a person? Here we got to get out our uh, therapeutic communication, right? How are you going to talk to this client? That's what you have to, to know. So, the patient is likely aware of the seriousness of his current situation. A lot of that could be because his wife's a nurse, right? She's retired. Um, so she's probably explained that. A lot of what's going on to him. Um, support the patient and family. Like giving them as much information as you can about their current status. Knowledge is power from a patient's perspective, so the more the client knows, the, the more um, in control of their situation they feel. When the nurse provides inf information, it will decrease the anxiety and fear for both the client and their family. Um, even in context of a client who is critically ill, when you supply matter-of-factly, share um, information about what you're doing and why, it demonstrates uh, caring and support that's needed. So how do you engage the client? So comfort is one thing. Make sure that the client's comfortable always. Um, Anticipate their needs. Try to stay ahead of what they're going to potentially ask before you leave the room. Perform um, your skills competently. Um, preserve dignity at all times whenever you're working with a client. And um, like I said, information and education is always going to be on your side. The more you engage and talk with your client the more you tell them what's going on or you keep them updated and that means going back into the room every you know 10 15 20 minutes you go back into the room because the more you engage with that client the better off they're going to feel um, and the less anxious they're going to be um, and sometimes even the less questions they're going to ask uh, so the more times you're interacting with them the less questions they're going to ask too So whenever you are now going to take the information you have from all the diagnostic tests that were performed. So now let's look at the results of that chest x-ray. What diagnostic results are relevant and must be noticed as clinically significant by the nurse? So we did a chest x-ray and it shows diffuse pulmonary infiltrates consistent with pulmonary edema. But why is this important? 
Well, this suggests that heart failure is present. Um, resulting in that plenary edema. And this could be contributing to the respiratory distress that the client is experiencing. Remember, they have a low O2 sat and the respirations are increased, right? So that's why it's, it's significant. So they also did a CT test. And this showed bilateral moderate pleural effusions with mild to moderate pericardial effusions. So pericardial and pleural effusion are related to that NDS process that the patient has. Um, and NDS can affect multi-system changes in the body. Uh, she has no other reason to have pericardial effusion since he has been healthy um, up until now. And pericardial infusions may be a precipitating atrial fib. So that can be part of his atrial fib coming from is from those um, pericardial infusions. So now I'll look at his lab. Currently, he has a white panel of 6.7, his hemoglobin 6.2, platelets 91, usually feels 52 bands or zero. Six weeks ago, this was his discharge lab work six weeks ago. Next, you want to look and say, why is this relevant? It must be recognized as significant. Well, white count is 6.7. That could be NDS can lower either one or all the three blood components in the stem cells in the bone marrow, which are the RBCs, WBCs, and platelets. WBCs can lower, but it's not critical. It's not, um, but you're going to continue to assess it. And always relevant because it's in correlation with the presence of inflammation or in infection, which he has, you know, could have either. We haven't heart ruled it out yet. Um, and it's usually increased and infection is present. So next, is it trending? Is it worse, stable, or improving? Well, we want to say it's worsening because it is um, on a little bit on the lower side than it should be. So now let's look at his hemoglobin. So he's had, um, he's got the leukemia, he's got the NDS going on. This we know is way too low. It's relevant because um, that anemia can uh, cause some of his symptoms that he's having right now, so that's worsening. His platelets are also too low as a result of that MDS. So he's at risk for bleeding with the low platelets. And then his neutrophils are 52. And so um, <clears throat> infections. That's what we're looking at when we look at the neutrophil. Infection can increase the neutrophil. Um, so, worsening as well. You're going to look at this electrolyte. So, whenever you're in the hospital on the floor and you're pulling up that patient's chart, you're going to look at the lab work like this and you're going to pull out anything that's abnormal. And then you're going to refer to that client's medical history and current diagnosis to see how that's impacted what's going on with them right now. <clears throat> so his sodium is 135. It's stable. His potassium is 4, so that's stable as well. His glucose it is stable as well. And um, his creatinine, which is um, your kidney function, is stable as well. So that, none of that is out of whack. It's all good and stable. Uh, his liver profile, uh, 
his albumin is a little bit decreased. So we've got some malnutrition going on there. His total bilirubin is also decreased. Um, could be related to the leukemia that's worsening. And his alkaline phosphatate is also worsening because that could be um, hepatomegaly, as you see, um, it's only um, right sided heart failure. Maybe you study that. Um, ALT is worsening. That can also be related to inflammation of that liver. And the AST is 144. That's also worsening because that can be related to the liver as well. Your troponin is um, stable. Your BNP, however, is elevated. BNP is a product of the heart. It's a CHF indicator. It's a lab work that we always draw <clears throat> to see how significant heart failure is. His BNP is slightly elevated, so we do know that he's in some heart failure, so that's worsening. And his magnesium is stable. Um, so, we had to put this all together and start thinking like a nurse. So these <laughs> next few questions, the part three, putting it all together to think about the nurse is what, what you need to answer. Interpreting all the clinical data collected, what are the most likely problems ranked by priority? <clears throat> which problems, which problem is most serious and why? In the next body systems will you assess most thoroughly already problem identify core specific nursing um, then the next question is number five what is the worst possible or most likely complication to based on the And then which orders do you implement first and why? So take a few minutes and interpret the clinical data. What are the most likely problems do you think with this patient is? And just kind of use notes. Start uh, and then a few answers. Um, let me see what you're thinking. Let's see if everybody's, if we're all thinking the same thing. So, interpreting the clinical data that you have, what are the most likely problems with this client? And kind of put them in order. So, what are the problems we've already identified? So we've already identified anemia, right? We've already identified heart failure. We've already identified pleural effusion. We've already identified pericardial effusion. And we've identified atrial fibrillation. So you should have five problems. Out of those five, put them in order as to What's the most important first and the least last? Least important is the last. You have five problems anemia, heart failure, well effusion, pericardial effusion, and atrial fib. 
to put them in order of priority. And think of it this way. <clears throat> Out of all five of those, which one has the potential to cause your patient the most harm right now? Whenever you're thinking about putting them in order, what can cause your patient the most harm right now out of those problems? Yeah, keep going. That's it. You're on the right track. <clears throat> You're on the right track. <clears throat> Y'all let me know what you what you what you're getting down. Out of all of that, what do you think can cause your patient the most harm right now? Everybody got something written down. Share with me if you had. Let me see what you got. Share with me what you got. So, so the out of all these diagnoses, remember we have anemia, heart failure, pleural effusion, pericardial effusion, and atrial fib. You put in order of priority. Out of all those five, out of those five. Your atrial fib is going to ca can cause your patient the most harm right this minute. It can cause the most harm right this minute is your atrial fib because they can break loose a clot, it's clot forming in the atria, right? Because it's not squeezing, it's just quivering, right? It's just kind of fluttery in there. That atria is not pumping, so it forms clots in that atrial, so you can dislodge a clot. So that is significant, significant right there. That heart rate can increase um, and, and really cause that, that patient some harm. So atrial is your first and top priority. Does everybody understand why that is? If not, let me know. There's a lot of complications from atrial fib. So then your second priority, your second priority is going to be your heart failure. Because once you get so much fluid into that heart space, it's hard to get it off. So you can have ineffective pump um, because of that backload of volume in the heart. It can't push, can't push it out fast enough. The heart, the heart can't pump it through the body fast enough. So that blood pressure is going to be low. Um, the next is going to be a pleural effusion. Now this is going to be more like a chronic problem um, can, uh, related to that shortness of breath. So you're just going to put some diuretics to the patient to that pleural effusion as well as that per pericardial infusion. Um, you're just going to watch it, monitor that, look at that client's blood pressure, um, looking for decreased cardiac output. How do you know if the patient has decreased cardiac output? What do you look at for that? 
about some of the things you would recognize as a decreased cardiac output? What would that be? Any takers on what you're assessing when you're assessing a decreased cardiac output? Decreased urine output, not necessarily kidney function. You're looking at the, the urinary output, yes. Decreased circulation in what way? When you say decre decreased circulation, what do you mean? In what way are you going to see that? Not hypertension, hypotension. Hypotension is decreased cardiac output. So we're looking at a low blood pressure. So your decreased cardiac output is going to be a low blood pressure and a low urine output. Yep. That's going to be, yes, hypotension. And then your anemia is going to be the last. Um, too low is a chronic problem, and it can be um, developed over time. But um, that would be your lowest priority is going to be the anemia. So this is your rank. A priority. So whenever you're looking at um, case studies and they ask you, so what's what can can cause your patient harm right now, or what's the the highest priority? You're going to look and focus on what's going to cause the most damage to my patient right this minute. What is the most life threatening? Atrial fib right this minute is the most life threatening because it can escalate into into um, heart So what is the pathophysiology of heart failure? So here you get to practice just a little bit. So when you think about pathophysiology, we're going to ask you to do pathophysiology in your, on your patient when you go to the, the hospital. What is your pathophysiology of your atrial fib? Yep, it's in the atria. Yep, lack of contractions. Yep. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's what it is. It's not contracting like it should. It's not contracting like it should. So, whenever we're asking you to write a pathophysiology, and we want it from the cellular level. And this is kind of what we're talking about. So with atrial fib, unlike other cells, cardiac cells are capable of self-stimulation. Although this ability is protective, if the heart's conduction system fails. It can also cause ectopic activity in the cardiac cells and result in atrial or worsening ventricular fibrillation. In atrial fibrillation, there are multiple arterial cells um, that self-stimulate, behaving as individual pacemakers and competing with the SA nodes. So remember, it's not contracting, it's just kind of just quivering. Uh, your normal atrial contractions are replaced by rapid quivering, yep, movements of that atria. Um, the atria stops contracting, is ineffective, so it's it, it pushes, it pumps a little bit, but it can't contract, it can't squeeze like it should. That's why we give digoxin. We want to increase that squeeze function. As uh, Dr. Shen used to say, he'd come into the patient room and say, we're going to put you on some digoxin to improve that heart squeezing ability. 
That's what he's talking about. That atria is not squeezing. So we're going to put you on some medicine to make it squeeze. So because it's, qu it's quivering, it's not contracting, that's why you don't see a P wave. Remember, there's no P wave because it's just quivering. Um, that lack of coordination of atrial contraction results in um, complications of atrial fib, which you have your rhombi formation and heart failure. So think about that atrial fib that we just learned about. This is where you see that heart failure and rhombus formation is caused by um, it can be the result of atrial fib. Is everybody kind of on that? You understand what we're getting at when we're talking about um, putting that into your, your own words? That uh, the priority pathophysiology. That's what that means. Good, good. So your next question is what body systems will you assess most early based on the primary or priority problem? And kind of give a priority nursing assessment assessment with that body system. So what body system do you think you need to assess first with this client? What body system? Yes, cardiac. Most definitely, that's your top priority. So you're going to be listening to what? Whenever you are doing a cardiac assessment for this client, what does it entail? Tell me everything you're going to do with a, a cardiac assessment for this client. Heart sounds is one. Rhythm is another. What else could you do? Yes, you could do an EKG. Well, monitoring and assessment, we're talking about doing an assessment, not monitoring. So think of a car, uh, an assessment is not the same as monitoring. If you're monitoring, that's going to be uh, like an intervention. Yes, your pulse. So we want to listen to your, your heart sounds. You want to get the rate and rhythm, right, a blood pressure because a low blood pressure can be, now an echocardiogram is an intervention, that's not an assessment. Um, your peripheral pulses, you can look for the strength and equality of those pulses, and capillary refill, because you're looking to see perfusion, because that's what capillary refill is you know, at less than three seconds, do they have perfusion in those um, extremities? So that's your cardiovascular nursing assessment. Nursing assessment. So now you've done your cardiovascular assessment. What checks body system that you think um, warrants nursing assessments? Respiratory, yes. Yes. Respiratory is going to be your next one. Followed by what? What do you think would be after your respiratory assessment? Cardiovascular and respiratory. Now think about your um, potential problems. What's your next, next body system to, to assess after respiratory? Cardiovascular and respiratory. Think about potential problems caused by your atrial fib. What would be a third body system you would assess for this client? Yep. So your respiratory, you're going to definitely look for any um, lung sounds, right? 
look at their respiratory rate, look at their oxygenation, do they have any pleuritic pain, do they have some sudden shortness of breath that could be um, attributed to like a pulmonary embolism. Neurologic, because if they develop a clot as a result of that atrial fib, it can travel to the brain and it can cause a stroke. So that's why that neuro assessment is going to come into play because you're going to have to look, anticipate that is, is a complication. Everybody with me so far on this? As to why we're looking at that? Yes, it would be your LAC. Your neurologic would be your LAC. You're looking at that level of consciousness. <clears throat> you want to see if they remain alert and oriented. Is their speech clear? Do they have any facial drooping? Are they having any weakness or numbness or tingling on one side of the body? So that would be part of your neuro workup as a nurse, as part of your neuro assessment. So nursing priorities, we're looking at um, our nursing priorities and goals will guide, guide the care of this client. If you had to develop a plan of care, so you're going to be looking at impaired gas exchange, which would be your heart failure or um, if it's tissue perfusion related to your atrial fib and anemia, you can look at those kind of things. Which are your number four questions up here at the top. <clears throat> right here, number four. Nursing priority, this is your um, plan of care for that client. Um, impaired gas exchange would be one that would be your your top priority you could put down. The goal is to improve oxygenation be for that. <clears throat> and then your effective, um, ineffective tissue perfusion would be your next one. So question number five says, what is the worst possible and most likely complication to anticipate based on the primary problem? So what is the worst possible thing that you think of can happen to this client as a result of what you determine to be their uh, primary or most likely complication. Yes, it could be a blood clot. Yep, stroke. Yep, that would be it. Yes, CBA. Mm -hmm. That's it. So remember, so we're basing this on the atrial fib as being the worst complication, right? So the worst thing that can happen with your atrial fib is a development of that stroke. And so they have a symptomatic and hypotensive uh, due to the atrial fib with a rapid RVR. CVA, which is an embol um, embolic event from the atrial fib, depending on how long they've been in that rhythm. So the longer a client's been in atrial fib, the greater the chance that they can have that CVA. So that's going to be your greatest complication. So that's what you would anticipate. So your nursing interventions to prevent this complication is going to be assess that cardiac rhythm continuously. So more than likely, you're going to have them on a monitor. You're going to have to do early identif identification of um, problems. So you're going to look at that blood pressure and that heart rate. You're going to look at presence of diaphoresis. You're going to look and see their cyanotic, what their capillary refills are like. Um, for the AFib early, um, how are you going to rescue that patient? Well, we may give them some cardiazem or some amiodarone 
to convert them chemically. So remember that if you can't convert the patient chemically with cardiozem or amiodarone, you're going to have to do a cardioversion, correct? That would be your next step. Is you got to try to prevent. Um, you got to reset that heart. You got to slow it down and reset it to a normal rhythm. To early assess your patient for stroke, you're going to assess their neuro, which is going to be their level of consciousness, closely, um, and look for any deficits, any facial droop or change in level of consciousness. You're going to have to assess them for that for that CBA. Um, pretty regularly um, to rescue the patient our interventions would be um, notify the physician of those neuro changes and get an order for a CT of the head uh, and get them uh, to radiology as soon as possible uh, to see if there is um, a stroke happening if they're suspected so does everybody understand when we get your worst worst problems and what you're going to do to rescue that patient. Everybody understand where we're at? <clears throat> because you have to, it's one thing to know what your complication is going to be. Next is you have to understand how do you identify any complications and then what do you anticipate the doctor is going to do or order for you to do um, to rescue that patient? So let's look at the collaborative care. <clears throat> State the rationale and expected outcome for the medical plan of care. So you have a list of orders here that the doctor has given you. So establish IV, get some blood cultures, get a urinalysis and a urine culture, and type and cross for some blood. Um, so we're going to transfuse our unit of blood. Cefepine, we're going to give IV. We're going to give it as an antibiotic as well as some vancomycin. So we're going to bring in some big guns there. Um, vancomycin, we're going to give that too. So we got two antibiotics we're going to give. Um, Cepetamine, um, one gram IV over 30 minutes. So you would need to look that up and see if it, we mix it in 50 or 100 and how fast you're going to infuse that over 30 minutes. So, you know, if it's 50, we're going to infuse it at 100 milliliters an hour. If it's in a 100 milliliter bag, it's going to be 200 milliliters an hour. Same with the vancomycin. What is that mixed in? Um, one gram is probably going to be mixed in 250. Um, and run that over an hour. So you would run that in at 250 milliliters an hour. More than likely, that's how that's going to be mixed. Um, and your dialtelazine, you're going to give that 10 milligrams IV, and you're just going to push that in kind of slow because it can uh, drop their heart rate and blood pressure. And then we're going to start them on a drip. Um, 5 to 15 milligrams um, a minute, and usually that's mixed a one-to-one ratio so if the doctor says start them at five milligrams you'll start them at five milligrams which would be five milliliters an hour so it's usually a one-to-one -one concentration when we're talking about a cardiac syndrome 
So now that you have those orders, put them in order of what you would do first. These are your orders right here. IV, blood cultures, urine, type and cross, pack cells, your two antibiotics, and your um, two doses of cardiosome. One's a um, times one dose and the other one is your drip. So you need to put those in the order of priority. What are you going to do first? What are you going to do first? Um, I would say that. So what are you what are you guys gonna do first and what are you guys gonna do second? Any takers? I see one. Some is already jumped in with their first choice. Anybody else got any ideas what you're going to do second? So whenever you're putting it in priority, make sure it's kind of going along with your problems that are going on with your patient and what can benefit them most quickly at that time. Let me all right check. So here we go. Your first one is put those IVs in because you can't do anything else without that IV, right? Everything else, everything's ordered IV for this patient. So you got to get the IV in first. You need to establish an IV as, as primary priority to administer any of the IV medications or blood products. So you got to have that first. So the next one is remember it could be underlying sepsis or some type of infection that's causing him to be an atrial fib. So we want to make sure that we go ahead and get those antibiotics on board. So that um, cefepine, we can run that in 30 minutes. So we're going to get that cefepine in and we're going to get that vancomycin and I'm going to go. Um, then we're going to give um, some medication to slow his heart rate down. So we get to address that infection because sometimes that infectious processes can be what's causing his heart rate to be elevated. And then we're going to give him some medicine to slow his heart rate down. And that will improve his um, perfusion. You'd be surprised how quickly antibiotics IV can, um, can help a patient as well. So this is your order of priority. And then this is your rationale as to why. So giving him um, blood product is, is important because his hemoglobin is low, but it's not going to address his infectious process at the time or really improve his heart rate. It may improve his blood pressure just a little bit, but one unit of blood, um, it takes a little bit more than that to make him 
I have a little bit higher pressure. Does everybody understand these priorities and why? Everybody kind of understand this while we have that order of priority and why it's like that. Okay, good. So, two hours later, we're going to go and evaluate this client. All the orders have been implemented bill has been admitted and just transferred to the cardiac uh, telemetry unit an hour ago. He's able to walk from the stretch to the bed and he's steady on his feet. He has a temp now of 98.6, so his temp has come down. His heart rate has also come down. He's gone, you know, for almost, what, 170. Now he's down to 108, so that's improved. His respirations have also improved. He's down to 20. Blood pressure has come up some. He's now 108 over 54. He has sat in 94% on two liters. Breath sounds are still diminished bilaterally. He still has fine crackles in the bases. He does not feel a shorter breath and his breathing is more comfortably now. He is still an atrial fib. His pack of blood cells is infusing. Um, it's going at 150 milliliters an hour and then he also has Cardiosum or dialysis drip going at five milligrams an hour. That's in a separate IV. So he's got two IVs, one with blood and going one with dialysis. Because remember, you can't infuse anything with blood. Nothing that infuses by itself always. Dialysis is going by itself at five milligrams an hour. He complains of pain that's just started, um, whereas IV is infusing. The side looks a little puffy and it's cool to touch. Lord, Bill, give me a break. Give me a break, Bill. Now you got an IV that's infiltrated. What can I say? So the nurse assesses the patient after implementing the plan of care. You interpret the clinical cues to determine if the patient's status is improving or declining. So you have a little handy-dandy chart right here that says assessment, assessment data. So just go through and check it. Is it improving? Is it declining? Or is there no change? So his rhythm is an atrial fib. Is that improving, declining, or no change? Heart rate's 108. Respirators are 20. BP 108 over 54. Which he set 94%. He's able to walk. Um, from the bed to the stretcher. Breath sounds diminished bilaterally with some fine crackles in the bases, but he complains about pain in the IV. And it's cool to touch. So just go through your little handy dandy checkbox there and just check what you think. And then we'll reveal the answers. So just refer back to the information that you have about Mr. Bill and check your little boxes. And then this is what we what you should have. Atrial fib, there's no change. He's still an atrial fib. He was an atrial fib when he came in and he's still an atrial fib. So that's no change. His heart rate's improving. Yes. His respiration is improving. Yes. His blood pressure is essentially the same. He's still on the low side, but he's still low with his blood pressure. His O2 sats have come up, so that's an improvement. He's now able to walk, whereas earlier he was unsteady on his feet, right? Um, breath sounds diminished, bilateral with fine crackles. There's no change in that. And the IV, yep, that's declining because it sounds like we got like an infiltration, right?
<clears throat> do you find going through this um, case study a little bit helpful? Now do you understand the significance of atrial fib and some of the problems that it can cause, such as the CHF, like heart failure? Because you're going to review your heart failure PowerPoints today, right? Because we have heart failure discussion tomorrow. We're going to do a case study, so make sure you review those today. Hopefully you find this a little helpful um, going through this case study. So the very last thing you need to answer is this. Reflect on your thinking to develop clinical judgment. To develop clinical judgment, reflect on your thinking that was used to complete this case study by answering the following questions. So answer those following questions and upload this to blog. You should be good to go. Anybody got any questions about this? Yeah, I know it would have helped. <clears throat> Do you kind of understand uh, a little bit more? Does this kind of help you understand, uh, give you a clear understanding a little, about, uh, a little bit more when it comes to your clinical assignments? Hopefully it does on how you're going to um, um, interpret some of the information that you have so you're not quite, don't feel quite so scattered. There's no other way to put it than you're scattered, right? Uh, this might help a little bit. Hopefully it helps. All right. Do I have any questions out there? This took a bit long, a little bit longer than I had anticipated, but hopefully um, you guys were on board and, and understand it does take a little time. Any questions? Anything I can help you guys with? So basically, if you sat in on this clinical judgment, this clinical um, case study, uh, you're kind of done with your um, your assignment, right? So I'm going to upload uh, hopefully this recorded session in just a little bit. It takes about 15 minutes or so, and I'm going to try to upload it to Blackboard for you guys because I think I have it recording. Um, any questions? If not, we're going to call it a day. And I'll see you guys in the morning for lecture. You're welcome. All right. See you guys tomorrow. And if you have any questions in the meantime, send me a message or an email already. And I'll talk to you guys later. I'm going to try to upload this now.